Hello and welcome everybody to a new video from Jörg, Joggler 66, Hour of the Truth. Well, as you can hear, I'm still having my cold. We have today the 6th of February 2018. I did already this afternoon a recording with Brother Brett on uh, Cold Word Babylon together. And um, I hope my voice will carry me through the hour that I have planned on the reading on the next reading, the 20th reading of the book The Secret History of the Jesuits by Edmond Paris. But I will not start with the book of Edmond Paris, and I'm going to tell you why. When we have a look at the little PDFs, you see we left off here in the PDF in the Secret History of the Jesuits on page 151, when we started reading here about Marconi, and um, then I told you that we were going to read the Vatican role in the Eustachian Genocide, as you can see here. And therefore I opened this paper, the Vatican role in the Eustachian uh, Genocide in the Independent State of Croatia, or the NDH, as it is also called. And this is a 19-page uh, paper that we came to, page 7. And there we're going to continue, there where it is highlighted here in the, in the yellow, probably go a sentence or two back. But, um, <laughs> you know, it is um, more or less a little bit of my habits to do some more research. And um, today I just stumbled upon a paper that I have on my computer already for a long time that is called Genocide in Croatia. Um, it speaks of 750,000 Serbs, it speaks of 60,000 Jews. This is a PDF of 64 pages, as you can see. And I got that some time ago from the website spirituallysmart.com. Um, I think Thomas Richards is the guy who uh, who is hosting the website spirituallysmart.com and um, I can only advise you to go there because that is really a very nice source of information. A very good information that you can get there. Um, yeah, what about w what I want to tell you is um, I was looking through this paper, Genocide in Croatia, and seeing, well, is that something that I could use? Uh, because I am, for the moment, in the secret history of the Jesuits with this subject busy, and of course, in the Vatican role in the Eustachia, it's also the same. So I went through that, and I saw some astonishing pictures. Um, not uh, very easy to swallow sometimes, the things that you see there. First of all, I want to show you this map here, so that you can see that uh, you have any idea where Croatia lies, especially for the people over there in the United States of America, are probably not that familiar with it. But here you have Italy. This is the Mediterranean Sea. The Adriatic Sea is just the Adriatic Sea and this part of the Mediterranean Sea. Then you go down here Italy, you have the Mediterranean and on the other side you have the Ligurian Sea. So Adriatic and Ligurian Sea are just other names for the Adriatic Sea. Uh, for the for, <laughs> for the Adriatic Sea, yeah, for for that. Um, anyway, then you have here on top you have Austria, here you have Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, here you have Greece, Albania, and this grey zone here, all this is Yugoslavia. It was uh, split up into Croatia and Serbia and Bosnia-Herzegovina at the end uh, uh, during the Second World War and these were parts here annexed by Italy, annexed by Italy, annexed by Italy as you can see this was a part annexed by Hungary, so annexed by Germany, annexed by Bulgaria so they really split that country up everybody got a little part and what was left over was the NDH the, uh, the, the independent state of Croatia as you can read here and there this genocide happened that um, Edmond Paris told us about in his book. Now, I'm not going through this whole paper here because there's one page I want to read to you, but here you see a lot of these pictures of the Eustachy guys, you see Pavelic, you see Stepinak, so the Cardinal and the Poglavnik. Poglavnik is another word for Führer. And uh, then of course you see even pictures of the atrocities, as you can see here. The Eustachys even took pictures following their heroic deeds bayonetting the seeds of the beast. Yeah? Everybody who was a Jew, who was a Croatian, uh, who was a Serb, 
and uh, an orthodox by that matter um, or a gypsy was a seed of the beast as they say that and there are some very disturbing pictures in this whole document just scrolling a little bit around it here you can see for example here we have a few of the Eustachi soldiers and the peasant who had to dig his own grave and the sadistic Eustachi show the knife with which they will kill him this is before the deed and this is fait accompli this is after they killed him and there he lies there are other pictures where you see how they almost dissemble the people here you have when they're wearing a head around as a trophy here you have uh, with the saw and knife and the gun that is used on this Serbian peasant on this orthodox yeah? the killers and the victims here you see how horribly mutilated these bullies are you see all the intestines coming out of this person um, the more heinous the crime the greater the promotion and decoration Eustachi therefore kept photographic records so that they would not be considered a bad Eustachi for an or an enemy of the state yeah. again those are the Eustachi masterpieces again the head is cut off from the body people are hanged people are tortured with knives and everything else here we have some children victims of the Croatian genocide yeah? starved and killed in any kind of manner here we have a picture from the Roman Catholic Church where they are all in a probably <laughs> we would say today kind of a satanic mess and uh, more pictures Pope Pius XII did he approve of that here you have someone with a split skull yeah, heroic deed of special Eustachi group called Skull Crushers. They sent pictures like this one to their leaders to show what good work they were doing. Yeah. So when you really go through this paper, and you can get still that you can still get that paper on the website, spiritually smart. It makes you sick when you read about this, about the persecution of the Jews, about the persecution of the Serbs, about the persecution of the Gypsies, about persecution and, uh, and, and, and killing and everything of men, women, children yeah? so yeah, this picture we saw already before with the opening of this uh, orphanage and uh, here you have of course again uh, Pavelic and uh, a few other high-ranking Nazis and uh, Bogi Hirvati yeah, so Hirvati, as you can read this word here, that states for Croatia, it stands for Croatia in the Croatian language. That's why it's NDH for the independent state of Croatia, the shortage. Yeah? And uh, some pictures, of course, together with the clergy from the Roman Catholic Church uh, doing the uh, Pavelic, doing the Hitler greeting or Roman greeting or whatever you want to call it. Then the Eustachi together here with monks, with friars of the Franciscan orders, even with nuns who participated in the atrocities, in the killings, in the tortures. And um, yeah, my idea was not to go through all this, that's true, so I'm gonna leave it with this, but I'm gonna go to page 55 of that document. And that I have opened here on the website spirituallysmart.com as you can read here on the top I'm on spirituallysmart.com I opened this document and um, this is uh, a PDF that you can get from that site and I'm on page 55 I just scrolled all through the pictures and now we are going a little bit to this here so but before I'm gonna read this I wanna put the picture here so that you can have this picture in the meantime and I'm going to read to you what is standing here because this what is here on page 55 I find very intriguing I find very important to read I find very important to share with all of you that we really learn what this Holocaust was all about I mean think about it why are they only always speaking about the Holocaust of the six million Jews that were killed by the Germans and never speak about the Holocaust that was perpetrated against the, against the uh, Orthodox Serbs 
against the Jews and against the gypsies in the satellite state of Croatia? Well, the answer is, and I can make an, a, a complete own video on, the answer is, of course, that um, the Holocaust the Germans perpetrated is needed in the minds of the people because they need to justify their <sighs> their state of Israel because of the Antichrist futurist agenda. Yeah? Because the Roman Catholic Church, the whole world teaches, no, the papacy is not the Antichrist. The Antichrist is someone who comes at the end of time. Yeah? And um, we, we are not supposed to know who the Antichrist is. And we don't need to care about it anyway, because we are being raptured out here. Uh, that is the 70 weeks of, of, of Daniel's prophecy. Then the Antichrist will be revealed. That's what they tell you. And real Bible-believing Christians and Bible students and history students, history-interested um, people who follow readings like this, know that the Antichrist always was, is, and always will be, until Jesus Christ comes back, the papacy of the Roman Catholic Church. So, they talk about this Holocaust all the time because they need to justify that state of Israel over there. What are they going to do with it? There are many, many meanings about that, and my meaning, in my humble opinion, that state of Israel over there in, at the Mediterranean is just one big concentration camp. And uh, the Roman Catholic Church hates the Jews from before the time of Jesus and surely after the time of Jesus. I'm not going to go into that. But we are speaking about what the secret history of the Jesuits is. Okay? And therefore we have to understand that when we come to this Croatian subject, that everything, the Ustashi that was founded there, and uh, Pavelic, the Poglavnik, the leader of that country, and uh, Cardinal Stepinak, and uh, the Papal Nuncio, Mor Mor Morcone, or what his name was? We, we read about him in the Secret History of the Jesuits. Well, it was Mar Marconi, right? Wasn't it Marconi here? Uh, yeah, yeah, Marconi, the Holy See's envoy. Um, that these guys all were there because of the Jesuits. So what I'm going to read to you right now is actually Jesuit politic. What does it read here? It reads, how to become a human butcher. What does that mean? Humans are not to be butchered. I mean, in my opinion, because I am vegan, even animals are not to be butchered, but certainly humans are not to be butchered. But when you are having an agenda that needs to kill hundreds of thousands, even millions and millions and millions of people, you need people to do their bidding, like they did all through the Dark Ages in the Inquisition, when they butchered the people with their torture. I mean, read Fox's Book of Martyrs of Things and sometimes and, and some, some things you read like that and you say, oh, wow, wow that, was, that was awful, people did that. I want to read to you this account of this 19-year-old Jose Oreskovic and tell you about what he experienced and how he was made a butcher of humans. Now just look at these pictures here. Yeah? A poor peasant woman and a child that did not live to tell the story nor did these notorious enemies opposed to Andrija Artukovic and their Eustachy. Yeah? Are these really notorious enemies? Huh. Look at this poor woman. This peasant woman will be able to quote-unquote see the murderers Artukovic and Pavelic. Their Eustachy gorged her eyes for the Poglavnik's collection. And then you're going to say, Oh, that, that is just a joke, they didn't do that. Well, in another part, in this document, what I'm going to read to you here on page 55, I don't, I don't know where, I don't know where to, <laughs> to turn there, I read through it that um, a guy was sitting in the office of Pavelic and uh, he had like of a little uh, a bowl in his, uh, in his office standing there and going in there with his hands, and it's like oysters, and that, were, that was just a collection of more than 40 human eyes that were gorged out of the faces of the people, like with this woman they did. But now, 
without any further ado, I just want to go and do the reading to you how to become a human butcher. Huh? And this will lead us then into the continuation of the reading of this part of the book, the Vatican role in the Eustacia, in, Eust in the independent state of Croatia, as a part of the reading of the secret history of the Jesuits, where we deal with the Jesuits' atrocities, among others, in Yugoslavia, where this Croatia comes from. That's the connection. So it reads here, champion Eustachy cutthroat M. Lux Luburic trained younger Eustachy how to become human butchers. With a specially made long bladed sharp knife, Luburic slashed an unbelievable number of throats in Jaselovac. You know, Jaselovac is one of the biggest concentration camps they had over there in that um, independent state of Croatia. Artukovic promoted him to the champion cutthroat group. An elite distinguished group at Jaselovac made up of notorious murderers like Franciscan monk Miroslav Majostorovic Filipovic, who boasted at his trial about the thousands he slaughtered. Uh, we are speaking about people, a Franciscan monk, who boasted on a trial about thousands that he slaughtered. Is that what a monk is supposed to do? But also, next to Miroslav Majostrovich Filipovic, Father Zvonko Brekalo, Father Kulina, Zvonko Lipovac, and others. How to become a human butcher. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. That's easier for me to read then. And you can still follow along. Jose Oreskovic, age 19, entered Yuzdashi in Zagreb, that is the capital of Yugoslavia at the time, in 1941. He was captured in late 1942. In his own words, he related his gruesome story in a calm, matter-of-fact manner, his training, his reaction and his ultimate participation in human butchery. What follows now is a complete quote. This is a verbatim of what he said. The quote starts, they and there he refers to the interned people of the concentration camp, like Jarzenovac. They slept under the bare sky. They were given only salty fish to eat, but although water was put in sight, they were not given any. The camp commanders ordered us to separate 200 prisoners from the first group. We then took them to the sea, which is the city of Pag, where they were slaughtered. 200 people were slaughtered at the sea by the city of Pag. Some of my comrades and I couldn't stomach the slaughtering. We couldn't do it. Then the commanders reprimanded us and upbraiding us asking what kind of Croatians and Eustachy we were we. They said, he who could not kill with joy a Jew, a Serb, a Gypsy or a Communist was not a Eustachy. In order to win us over to do the killing, they gave us younger ones wine and liquor. They brought in girl prisoners, stripped them naked and told us to choose whichever we, one we wanted. However, after the sexual intercourse with the girl, we were to kill her. Some of the boys got drunk and got carried away. They were able to do it. I couldn't. It revolted me. And I said so openly. A few days later, a high functionary, Luburic was his name, came to the camp from Zagreb. He came to see the work at the camp. That's when the real massacres began. Our men killed so many people that the whole sea around Pag was red with blood. You know, this reminds me of the River Seine in Paris, who was, as they say, red with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, the protestant Huguenots who were killed in the St. Uh, Bartholomew massacre. Continuing, he says, Luburic was informed that I and some of the others had refused to kill. Luburic then called all of us Eustachy together. We stood in formation. He made a speech in which he said that those who could not kill Serbs, Jews, Gypsies and Communists were traitors to the Eustachy state. He then asked who of us 
could not kill. I answered, as did several others. Since my voice was the first to speak out, Luburic called me out of line and as I stood in front of the formation, Luburic asked, What kind of Eustachy are you, if you cannot kill a Serb or a Jew? I told him that I was ready to give my life for the leader, Poglavnik Pavelic, at any time, and that I would be able to kill an enemy in battle. But I just could not kill unarmed people, especially women and little children. He laughed so loud and said this, that this, too, was a battle. That Serbs, Jews, Gypsies and Partisans were not people but wild beasts. And that it was the duty of all us, Eustachy, to clear Croatia of this pestilence. And whosoever refused to assist is as much an enemy of the leader and, uh, and Croatia as they were. So in other words, what did George W. Bush say after 9-11? Whether you're with us or you're with the terrorists, right? What does Lu uh, this... Um, uh, Lub, um, <laughs> Luburic say here? He says, And whosoever refused to assist is as much an enemy of the leader, Pogravnik, and of Croatia as they were. The Jews, the Gypsies, the Communists and the Serbs. Okay? Anything new in the world when George W. Bush spoke that whether you're with us or with the enemy? No. It's the same what this guy Luburic already said in 1941. Luburic then called one of his men and whispered something. The, men uh, the man left the room. He, turn he returned with two small two-year-old children. Luburic said they were Jewish children and he handed one over to me and told me to kill the baby. I answered, I couldn't do it. Whereupon all those around me burst into laughter and teased me. Then Luburic took out his knife and slit the throat of the child in front of me, saying, There! That's the way to do it! The sound of the child's scream and the blood gushing out made me faint. I almost fell. One of the Eustachy caught me. When I had somehow pulled myself together, Luburic ordered me to raise my right foot. I did so, and he put the other child under my foot. Then he commanded, Smash! I did just that. I crushed the child's head with my foot. Luburic patted me on the shoulder and said, Bravo! You'll make a good Eustachy yet! That is how I committed my first murder. After killing this first child, I got dead drunk. While drunk, some of us raped some Jewish girls and then killed them. Later, I didn't have to get drunk. Afterwards, when Slano was liquidated and all its prisoners killed, I was sent to the district of Corentia to clean out the Serbs. You know what my record is there. That is what we can read elsewhere. For the moment, I want to leave it with, with what Jose Oreskovic, aged 19, tells us here. 19. The average age of the American soldier in the Vietnam War. An innocent young man who was made a brutal butcher of man. In the example that we just read here giving them alcohol and then letting rape women and afterwards kill them? What did they do in the other armies? Giving the people opium, cocaine and other kinds of drugs to get them sedated and then do their bidding. That's always, that was always their idea, right? Now, I hope that you learned something of this little reading and you can of course go to Spiritually Smart and read the whole document and avail yourselves of the information that is out there. I think 
that sometimes these readings are quite abstract. And I want to make it a little bit more vivid so that you can really imagine what it is like to be in a war like that. And to be called out in front of all the other people and then what group pressure and the pressure of a superior who asks of you to just stamp your feet on the head of a two-year-old little innocent baby, what that can do to you. And we just experience what that could do to this 19-year-old man. And how he, after this first killing, became a bloodthirsty killing machine. These guys went out with their special blades into Jazenovac and other concentration camps and killed hundreds if not thousands of people a night by slitting their throats and cutting them open. Those are the atrocities, the atrocities of war. This is the secret history of the Jesuits that we read about here. So, I'm going to put the picture on the right page again here, and then we're going to see to continue. We were reading in that book, but I'm continuing now in the other from that I copied from that website, the Vatican role in the Eustacia genocide and the independent state of Croatia, where we left off last time. Here on page 7, we are speaking again about Cornwall. You know, remember, Cornwall was the one who had this book, Hitler's Pope, the picture I just put up here. Cornwall wrote that the nature of the Eustacia regime was well known to the Vatican from the beginning. So that means what we've just read from that website Spiritually Smart, that was about the Eustacia executing, terminating, genociding little children, innocent women and men. And that nature of the Eustacia re regime was well known to the Vatican from the beginning. From the outset, the public acts and statements concerning ethnic cleansing and the anti-Semitic programs were well known to the Catholic Episcopate and Catholic Action. These racist and anti-Semitic programs were therefore also known by the Holy See and thus by Pacelli at the point when we greeted Pavelic at the Vatican. When he greeted Pavelic at the Vatican. These acts were known, moreover, at the very point when clandestine diplomatic links were being forged between Croatia and the Holy See. On May 8, 1941, Pavelic met Pope Pius XII at the Vatican in what Cornwall described as a, quote, devotional audience with the Pope. At this meeting, the Vatican de facto recognized the so-called independent state of Croatia, the NDH. You know, make the distinction between de facto and de jure. At this meeting, the Vatican de facto recognized the so-called independent state of Croatia, which included Bosnia-Herzegovina, even though the NDH was an occupied Nazi puppet state, or the creation of Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini, maintained not by popular will, by election, but by military force. Moreover, Abbot Ramiro Marconi, the papal nuncio to that country, was appointed the apostolic legate or nuncio to Zagreb, the personal representative of the Pope to the NDH. Marconi was a priest of the Benedictine monastery of Montevergine. He was the personal emissary or ambassador of the Pope to the NDH regime. Marconi and his secretary, Giuseppe Masucci, would visit the NDH and be photographed with Ante Pavelic, Andrea Artukovic, Aloysius Stepinak and German and Italian military officers. He was photographed with Pavelic in the town of Zapresic, northwest of Zagreb, with his secretary Giuseppe Masucci. He was also photographed with Stepinak together with Roman Catholic priests and fascist military officers who are shown giving a fascist salute. We have seen a few of these pictures and I'm going to show to you a few more here. Like for example here you have Marconi and doing the Hitler greeting by Pavelic here. 
And uh, here you have Marcone and Pavelic again. Here you have this picture. Here you have them leaving a church. Um, okay, and these are pictures that we are going to see a little bit later on. But here you have um, Monsignor Ivan Saric, also a Ustashi covering for from the from the Roman Catholic Church. Here you have Stepinak and Marcone together with a Nazi general. Let's leave this picture on for a moment. Giuseppe Ramiro Marcone was born in 1882 in Italy. He was ordained a priest of the Order of St. Benedict in 1906. In 1918, that means at the end of World War I, he was appointed the abbot of Montevergine, monastery in Italy. He lectured in philosophy at the College of San Anselmo in Rome. According to Cornwell, the author of Hitler's Pope, Marconi had clearly been selected to soothe and encourage the Eustachi leaders by Pacelli himself. Marconi died in 1952. At the time of the Vatican de facto recognized the Eustachia NDH state, did it know of the massacres against, Serb? against Serbs? The atrocities were described by Carlo Falconi in his documentation of the crimes in The Silence of Pius XII, which was published by Faber in 1970 in London. On April 28, 1941, Ustasha troops attacked the Bjelova district where 250 Serbs were killed and being buried alive. In Otokak, several days later, 331 Serbs were murdered. On May 14 in Glina, hundreds of Serbs were murdered in the Orthodox Church after being forcefully converted to Roman Catholicism. So this is what they do. They say, convert or die, people convert, and then they kill them anyway. And you know why? Because they don't have their salvation anymore. Not speaking about Orthodox now, who converted to Roman Catholicism, but think about Protestants, who give up their salvation by converting to Roman Catholicism in order to save their lives, and then being killed, probably not saved anymore. There is no evidence that the Vatican or Pope Pius knew of these mass murders. Is there no evidence? <laughs> well, what did the Vatican know then? The Vatican knew that Ante Pavelic was a totalitarian dictator, a fanatical Croat ultra-nationalist zealot and Roman Catholic who was sponsored and installed in power by Adolf Hitler on the one hand and by Benito Mussolini on the other. They knew Pervelic was a hardcore fascist who supported and endorsed Nazi Germany and fascist Italy. They knew about the anti-Serbian, anti-Jewish, anti-Roma laws that the NDH had passed. The Vatican knew Pervelic was committed to the policy of forceful conversion of Orthodox Serbs to Roman Catholicism. Moreover, the Vatican knew also that the NDH was a Nazi puppet state created by Nazi Germany that was under German military occupation and control. The NDH was not recognized by the United States, Great Britain or the Soviet Union. The NDH declared war against the Soviet Union and sent Croatian volunteers to participate in Operation Barbarossa. Operation Barbarossa, for the ones who don't know, that was the German um, campaign against Russia. The NDH had even declared war on the Allies, declaring war against the US and Britain on December 12, 1941, and had sent 8,000 troops to the Russian front, even sending troops to Stalingrad. The Allies did not recognize the NDH, an Axis belligerent or enemy state. The Vatican, however, did, even if de facto. The genocide committed in the NDH was open and common knowledge. In the Catholic Church and the Holocaust between 1930-1965, in uh, Indiana University Press from 2000, historian Michael Fayer concluded that, quote, it is impossible to believe that Stepinak and the Vatican did not know that the Eustachia murders amounted to genocide. Unquote. It is impossible to believe. Why? 
because even though they maybe don't admit it, every finger points at them. Every finger points at their knowledge, at their involvement. Yeah? The massacres and atrocities, indeed the planned and systematic genocide, were known to the Croatian Catholic clergy and to the Episcopate. As Cornwell noted, quote, the clergy often took a leading part, unquote. Not only did the Croatian church and clergy know they were at the forefront of the genocide, the Croatian Roman Catholic priests organized and led the mass murders. As Conwell noted, priests were in many instances the instigators and even the leaders of the genocide. Quote, priests, invariably Franciscans, took a leading part in the massacres. Individual Franciscans killed, set fire to homes, sacked villages and laid waste the Bosnian countryside at the head of Eustachi bands. Unquote. He cited an Italian reporter who described an attack in September 1941 south of Banja Luka in northern Bosnia. A Franciscan priest was exhorting Eustachi troops with a crucifix. It was the intervention of Italian troops that prevented a larger bloodbath. The Italian army provided protection to Serbs, Jews and Roma, saving thousands of lives. The Vatican could plead ignorance with what was occurring in Poland and elsewhere in Europe, but not in Croatia. According to Cornwell, Pacelli was better informed of the situation in Croatia than he was of anywhere else in Europe other than Italy. His legate Marconi made repeated visits to Croatia and brought back eyewitness accounts. Croatian bishops, some of who sat in the Eustacia parliament, communicated with the Pope and the Vatican on a regular basis. Pacelli also had access to the BBC, which was monitored and translated for the Vatican by Francis Osborne, the British minister to the Vatican. The BBC broadcast news, uh, news reports on the atrocities in Croatia, which no one could miss. On February 16, 1942, the BBC broadcast the following report attacking Zagreb Archbishop Stepinak for his complicity in the mass murders. Quote, this is from the BBC broadcast. The worst atrocities are being committed in the environs of the Archbishop of Zagreb. The blood of brothers is flowing in streams. The Orthodox are being forcibly converted to Catholicism and we do not hear the Archbishop's voice preaching revolt. Instead, it is reported that he is taking part in Nazi and fascist parades. Unquote. That was the broadcast from the BBC. How was it possible for the Vatican not to know of these mass murders and forceful conversions when the Roman Catholic Church was hierarchical in organization? Well, as Cornwell asked, quote, how was it that despite the strictly authoritarian power relationship between the papacy and the local church, a power relationship that Pacelli had done so much to establish, but Charlie the Pope, not to forget, no attempt was made from the Vatican Center to halt the killings, the forced conversions, the appropriation of orthodoxy property. Why didn't Pacelli disassociate the Vatican from the Eustacia genocidal policies? Why didn't Pacelli condemn the perpetrators attacking the genocide? If the Vatican took a more forceful stance, could lives have been saved? The answer to this question can be found in the actions of the Vatican before, during and after the Roman Catholic sponsored genocide in the NDH. What is most revealing is the position of the Church after the war, when the full extent of the genocide was fully known. I'm gonna going to going to copy this here. I think I have to put this in my search engine in just a second. So let's continue reading here. 
and here we see of course another picture of Marconi yeah, the papal nuncio to the NDH what was the extent of the genocide in the NDH Conwell remarked quote, the tally almost defies belief he offered these numbers from the final solution origins and implementation edited by David Cesarini published in London and Rutledge uh, publishing in 1996 487,000 Orthodox Serbs, 27,000 Gypsies were murdered between 1941 and 1945 in the independent state of Croatia, the NDH. Out of a population of 45,000 Jews, approximately 30,000 were murdered during the same period. 20 to 25,000 were murdered in the Croatian death camps, such as Jasenovac and Nova Gradiska, while 7,000 were sent to the gas chambers. Even if we assume these figures are inflated and subject to debate, the extent of the genocide was not minimal or insignificant. This was a genocide. Be sure of that. Now what I just copied here are pictures of the Nova Gradiska concentration camp that you can find here on Google Pictures. And this is why I will leave this for a moment on. These pictures are what we've just read about. Yeah? We read about the Croatian death camps such as Jasenovac, and I told, showed you a picture of that already before. And the other one, Nova Gradiska, that's this one. And there you have these pictures here. This is what you find when you do a Google search on the concentration camp with the name of Nova Gradiska, where thousands and thousands of Jews and Orthodox Serbs and Gypsies were killed during the NDH, during the independent state of Croatia between 1941 and 1945. Sometimes pictures say more than a thousand words. Let's just have a look. As you can see, most of the pictures are original from that time. Sometimes they get idiotic pictures in a search like this. Doesn't this make you scream, never again? Well, the Roman Catholic Church screams the hardest, never again. No more war. Peace, peace, peace. And the Bible says, when they call for peace and safety, sudden destruction will come upon them. Why? Because the only one who can bring peace is the real Prince of Peace, and that is Jesus Christ. And when he comes back, he will bring us real peace. In the meantime, we have to deal with things like this. So I'm going to continue the reading, and you can still have a look at the pictures of the concentration camp here on the right. The picture, this one here in the document, shows Vatican Nuncio, or Legate Ramiro Marcone, in the center, yeah, the corpulent guy, with Poglavnik anti -Pavelic. Poglavnik is the Croatian version of what we have in Germany for Führer, for Adolf Hitler, or what was in Italy for the Duce Mussolini, that is the Poglavnik, anti pavelic on the right, and the Vatican Secretary the Nuncio Giuseppe Masucci here on the right side. Operation Barbarossa and the Tisserand Plan. Let's just see how far we are. Okay, just had to check that. The Vatican regarded the Soviet Union and the spread of communism as their greatest threats. Yeah, of course, I have to make a little comment here, because we know that that is not the truth. That is what they say to the outside. That is the exoteric teaching. The esoteric teaching is something else. The Vatican started the communism through the Jesuits, with the reductions of Paraguay. You remember in earlier parts of the book reading of the Secret History of the Jesuits, we went into the Reductiones of Paraguay. Yeah? 
that was where communism was perfected. And then they started the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia to get rid of the Tsar who gave aid to Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War in the United States of America. Therefore he had to be killed, that was revenge. And of course the Jesuits installed atheistic communism in the quote-unquote Soviet Union after that because in that way they could kill off the Orthodox. Like the same Orthodox, yes, we are speaking about here in Serbia. The Orthodox Church, you have the Eastern Catholic Church, let's call it that way. There was a schism in 1054. And the Eastern Catholic Church split from the Western Catholic Church. That was the Roman Church. And the Eastern Catholic Church became the Orthodox Church. They were not in agreement with the Western Catholic Church, with the Roman Catholic Church, about the Ultramontanism, the situation, the leading position of the Pope, first of all, that the Bishop of Rome was the universal bishop, the Pontifex Maximus, that hierarchical system they did not agree on, and they did not agree on Mariology and all the idol worship within the Roman Catholic Church. That's why they split up. And so you have the Western Church and you have the Eastern Church. And that Eastern Church, of course, was for the most part centered in Constantinople, but at that time Constantinople was already taken over by the Turks, by Islam. So you had that church in Greece, that's why you have the Greece Orthodox, and then going up to the north into Russia, and all the countries in between. And as you saw in the beginning of the map, uh, what I told you, what I showed you in this uh, in this book, that you saw the surrounding countries on the top of there, uh, on the northeast of that, of course, is Russia, and the Orthodox Church was in Russia and was flourishing there, because the Tsar was the protector of the church. That's why the Tsar had to go, and a atheistic communist regime had to be installed that would persecute the. Orthodox Church. Because for the Orthodox, the Roman Catholics had the credo convert or die. So, and because they didn't want to convert, they just killed them. Stalin killed more than 15 million Orthodox Russians during his reign. That's a Holocaust never spoken about. Maybe we do that in the future. But when it says here the Vatican regarded the Soviet Union and the spread of communism as their greatest threats, no, that's a joke, because the Soviet Union and communism was founded by the Jesuits. They always play both sides. They play the side of capitalistic West, United States of America first and for all at that time. They played the side of Nazi Germany. They played the side of fascist Italy. They played the side of communist Russia. Remember the oath of the Jesuits, where it says that you got to do what your superior told you, even though when your brother, who is secretly engaged on the other side. Huh? The Jesuits always control both sides of the story. So when... The author says here, the Vatican regarded the Soviet Union and the spread of communism as their greatest threats. No, that is only a sign that this author doesn't give you the full, the complete information as it should be given. Okay. The Balkans were seen as a buffer between the Vatican and Soviet Russia, Eastern Orthodox Russia. Well. Let's go here back to genocide in Croatia. We have seen here in the beginning the map, right? Here it is, the map. You see here Italy, you see here Austria, Hungary, R Romania, Bulgaria. Here beneath you see Greece. And what is above Hungary and Romania? Russia. Uh, and here you have the buffer, Yugoslavia. Uh, and that's what we are talking about. The Vatican saw the conquest and destruct. Uh, no, it, it was. <laughs> um, the Balkans were seen as a buffer between the Vatican and Soviet Russia, 
Eastern Orthodox Russia. As Cornwell noted, Benito Mussolini's invasion and occupation of Greece and Yugoslavia was supported. The Italian war against Greece was seen with a measure of optimism by the Vatican. Benito Mussolini had provided bases and training camps to anti Pavelic before the war. Croat and Bosnian Muslim troops from the NDH would join Italian and German troops on the Western Front in the Soviet Union. The Vatican saw the conquest and destruction of Yugoslavia and Russia by Nazi Germany and Fascist Italy as opportunities for the expansion of Roman Catholicism into the East. The Germans go in there, kill all the Russians, convert or die. The Italians come from south via Greece and kill the Serbs and the Orthodox in Yugoslavia, also into Russia, convert or die. And of course the Vatican saw the conquest and destruction of Yugoslavia and Russia by Nazi Germany and Fascist Italy working together as opportunities for the expansion of Roman Catholicism into the East. Because when the Orthodox, when the Jewish and the Protestant opposition is out of the way, what leaves it? It leaves you with Roman Catholicism. That's the plan all along. Eugène Tisserand was appointed in 1936 the Vatican Secretary of the Congregation for the Eastern Churches, holding the post until 1959. He was a French priest who held several prominent high-level positions at the Vatican. He was infamous for the so-called Tisserand Plan, which was a plan to convert Eastern Orthodox to Roman Catholicism. Here we see a picture of the decisive Battle of World War II, when the Russian Red Army troops with T-34 tanks attacked German positions at Kursk, 1943, and that started the German retreat. The Tisserand Plan, the document continues, was documented by Reinhard Heydrich, head of the RSHA, in his report, quote, New Tactics in Vatican-Russia Work. <laughs> Isn't that an interesting name for a working paper of Reinhard Heydrich? New Tactics in Vatican-Russia Work? For the Vatican, the destruction and dismemberment of Yugoslavia was an opportunity to expand Roman Catholicism in the Balkans and Eastern Europe. We just said that a little bit earlier too. The weakening and even outright destruction of the rival Orthodox Church was planned and expected. The Vatican had its sights on Russia and Eastern Europe as well. In the entity Five Centuries of v Secret Vatican Espionage, published in 2008 by Eric Fratini, translated by Dick Cluster, the Tisserand plan is analyzed. Tisserand and Father Robert Lieber devised the plan to use the German conquest and occupation of the Soviet Union to expand Roman Catholic influence. Testifying at the Nuremberg Trials on October 2, 1945, Franz von Papen, the Knight of Malta and the Vice-Chancellor behind Hitler stated, quote, The re-evangelization of the Soviet Union was a Vatican operation, whether carried out through its missionary department or its secret service, meaning violence, meaning Jesuit shock troops, the SS or the Ustashi in other places. What did I highlight right here? The re-evangelization of the Soviet Union was a Vatican operation. Re-evangelization? Well, the Catholicization of the Soviet Union. That were the plans all along. Getting rid of orthodox, uh, orthodoxy and installing Roman Catholicism. Installing the Church of Satan. 
In the Soviet Union, the plan was led by Niccolo Estorzi and Holy Alliance agents. Heydrich wrote in his report, quote, The Pope's agents are taking advantage of the situation, and this must be stopped. Unquote. Vatican agents were infiltrating Nazi-occupied areas of Russia to convert them to Catholicism. The decisive battle of World War II was at the Eastern Front in 1943 at Kursk. This battle broke the back of the German army and forced it into a strategic retreat for the remainder of the war. Germany would lose the war. What the Vatican did was to prepare for the military defeat of Germany. The Vatican began to disassociate itself from the more extreme elements of fascism. Now I have to tell you something when I read this here. It becomes clear as water, clear as spring water. They could not continue with the war and through the war, the castleization or the re-evangelization, as Franz von Papen calls it, of the Soviet Union. They just couldn't go on with that. It would probably take too much time. So they decided to do it otherwise. Let Hitler retreat, destroy Germany, destroy Protestantism in Germany, and in the meantime, installing communism with the Soviet Union very, very deep in Russia, former Russia, in the Soviet Union, and get all the Roman, uh, all the Orthodox by convert or die, by the genocide that Stalin did later on. It was just a change of plans. The war did what he did, and now they are taking other measures. But the goal still stays the same. So what the Vatican did was to prepare for the military defeat of Germany. First they planned Germany must win because they work in our agenda, they work for the re-evangelization of the Soviet Union, but now we're gonna do it in another way, in another manner. And in that way, in the same way, well, we're gonna kill the Germans off also and crush Germany. The Vatican began to disassociate itself from the more extreme elements of fascism. It was at this time that Krunoslav Draganovic settled at the Vatican, leaving his position in the NDH regime and preparing the way for the escape of the leaders of the NDH regime and the plundered property and assets they had seized from the murdered Serbs, Jews and Roma. Investigators after the war determined that $80 million was smuggled out of the NDH. The Vatican provided help in storing the proceeds and in allowing it to be laundered. And here I have to remember you that I am going to read the book The Real Odessa by Yuki Goni and then you can learn more on that subject. That subject of people fleeing these countries and coming into um, South America, Argentina, most of all in the first place, Brazil, Chile, and of course via Operation Paperclip um, into the United States of America. Now I've reached 58 minutes and this was a quite extensive reading. I'm sorry I didn't finish, but I want to leave on a high note. And the high note is that next time we will continue in this paper about American knowledge. What did the Americans know? And I can tell you that it is getting very, very interesting. So next time in the 21st reading and discussion of the book The Secret History of the Jesuits, of which I have not read a word today, all right, we are going back to this paper, The Vatican Roll, in the Eustacia genocide in the independent state of Croatia. We will finish this because it's only eight pages left and there are some pictures in there, so I'm going to finish that in the next reading. And then we will go back into the secret history of the Jesuits and continue uh, here with Cardinal Marcone where we left off. And we were going to continue here. But I thought it was quite an interesting excursion that we did today on the genocide of Yugoslavia, on the genocide of Croatia.
the genocide that was done uh, by Croatian Ustasis, by the, uh, by the Croatian hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church, backed by Rome that de facto acknowledged the NDH state of Croatia in the Second World War. And I also found it very important that we read um, this testimony of how to become a butcher of humans, as I read to you. Now you can say, well, that was brutal. Well, I'm only reading about it. There are people out there who live that, who live by that, and who daily do those things. Now that is what I call brutal. But I'm teaching you this because only when you understand your history, you can make predictions for the future. When you see what happened there in Yugoslavia, you will maybe see that this is coming to you in the United States of America in the future. And I don't want to be the bearer of bad news, but you can make up your own mind by doing your own studies. And with all the studies, never forget, in the very first place, open your Bible. Read the King James Bible. There is the only truth in. But this historical knowledge is important for you to know too. So I hope you enjoyed my reading and you learned something and I maybe sparked a little that you are going to do your own research in this regard and um, will come to a brighter knowledge, to a broader knowledge of these facts and that you will see that there is on the internet much, much, much disinformation and that when you really do your own studies based on the Bible, that you see that what I told you today is the truth. That's why I call my ministry Hour of the Truth. You're getting one hour full of truth. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. And until next time, Jogna 66 from Hour of the Truth says, God bless you and bye bye. Uh, special I work um, in dealing with the infiltration of churches and religious institutions as well as government uh, that, that cover a tremendous uh, number of institutions. And the purpose of that infiltration was what for? Well, the purpose is what the Roman Catholic system has all the time as, a, as her own purpose is to infiltrate, to penetrate all the areas of life where the Ro Roman Catholic can have control and access for the coming world government. Simply put, this country and this world benefit from your commitment to Jesuit principles, to being men. As a graduate of another great Jesuit institution, Xavier University, I have great affection for the value and purpose of a Jesuit education. What that means is in preparation for that world government, the Roman Catholic institution, especially since the establishment of the Jesuit order in 1541, throughout all these 500 years, they've been in preparation and in, in, in through infiltration and penetration of every uh, level uh, of society in order to uh, take over uh, the world uh, politically and religiously. What a beautiful day! Lord has made. Holy Father, on behalf of Michelle and myself, welcome to the White House. There are two doctrines that define very well these, uh, these dangerous goals of the Roman Catholic institution. Two doctrines uh, define this very well. One is called the doctrine of the apostolic succession and that is dealing with the papacy and the other is the doctrine the temporal power and that is dealing with world government of course both because you can see that even the pope and his own individual office he meet 
those requirements. Uh, he is not only the head of his church, as he called himself, John Paul II, the present Pope, he said he is the pastor of his church. He is not only that, uh, but he is the head of his estate. It is a sign, perhaps, of how far we have come in this country that today's news of formal recognition between the governments of the United States and the Vatican did not create a furor. Once upon a time, it would have. Once upon a time, and not all that long ago, it did. From the time of President Washington, there was the first president to be utilized by the Jesuits. If you were not aware of that, President Washington already was initiated by the Jesuits to bring about the first communication with the Vatican ever known in this country. From there on, uh, uh, President Reagan, uh, to all this time, President Reagan has come to fulfill the greatest, uh, uh, the greatest moment in the history of this conspiracy.